A boy wakes up, completely disoriented, in a place he's never seen. His mother has spirited him away from his teacher and all he has known. Quote, his opening eyes felt daylight pouring in. He was stunned by what he saw. Everything he sees is changed and unfamiliar, and he isn't sure he recognizes his mother, who hugs the frightened child and soothes him. What follows? For this is the Achilles, and the text is the Achilles, which tells a version of his life before the Trojan War. It's his mother Thetis' attempt to get him to put on women's clothes and act like a girl. This cross-dressing is the part of his story which interests most scholars today, as in P.J. Heslin's wonderful study, Transvestite Achilles, and we will look at it later. But the most famous medieval echo of the Achilles is Dante's evocation of that disoriented boy. In Canto Nine of the Purgatorio, awaking after his terrible dream of the eagle and fire, Dante says, quote, not otherwise did Achilles shake himself, turning his awakened eyes about in a circle, not knowing where he was when his mother fled with him sleeping in her arms from Chiron to Skyros, whence the Greeks later took him away. Then I shook myself as soon as sleep fled from my face and turned pale as one does who freezes in terror, unquote. This is Purgatorio 934. Dante probably read the Achilles in school, for it was a popular basic medieval school text. The clinical research on memory, emotion, and empathy that I cited in the first lecture suggests that this passage could reflect a school memory of identifying with a great figure in a rare moment of absolute vulnerability. Dante's evocation of the Achilles reminds us of how specific scenes and emotions, rather than larger structures and abstracted lessons or interpretations of texts, read while we are young, often become the most dominant textual memories. Just as young Augustine's favorite parts of the Aeneid, Dido's suicide, the Trojan horse with armed men inside, Troy burning, and the ghost of Creusa, are not those that receive the most attention by scholars today, so too Achilles' waking scene has not drawn significant attention in the studies of the Achilles as opposed to the Purgatorio. In fact, until very recently, there have been few full-scale studies of the work at all. And I count myself among those who used to skip this waking up scene to get on to the more interesting cross-dressing stuff that comes later. While during any period and in any form, school is a haven for some students and a kind of hell for others, it's always a time of at least temporary disorientation and abandonment by mothers or other caretakers as often as by husbands or lovers is a recurring narrative element in the classical texts read in medieval schools. Since only a few shared markers are needed for empathic connections with fictional characters, medieval students could identify with the helplessness of the boy hero Achilles and with the abandoned women Creusa and Dido in the Aeneid without a sense of incongruity. Perhaps I am alone, although I suspect not, in remembering in great detail odd parts of school texts from my own childhood unappreciated in modern literary scholarship. And it's hard to think of two classical texts widely read in medieval schools that are more underappreciated by scholars now, at least until very recently, than the Achilles of Statius, probably written around 95 to 96 in the Common Era, and surviving, according to Harold Anderson's comprehensive catalog of all Statius manuscripts, in about 220 manuscripts down to the early 16th century. Even more neglected is the Ilias Latina, or Latin Iliad, written during the reign of Nero by Bibius Italicus, and extant in at least 140 manuscripts, according to Marco Scafai. In fact, the Ilias Latina is so neglected that it's not even included in the Loeb series. And when I contacted the marketing editor just to make sure, because I kept looking for it, he said, very embarrassed, no, we don't have it, but it is coming out in the revised minor Latin poems whenever that happens. The Ilias Latina is an epitome of all of the Iliad in about the same number of lines as one book of the original. And the author's name was only re relatively recently deciphered from initial letter acrostics. The text was also known as the Homerus Latinus, Latin Homer, and its translator was thought to be a certain Pindar of Thebes. These two works are on almost every medieval curricular author's list of what students, what students should read. In addition, they also figure prominently in the consensus of what modern medievalists 
believed to have been read in medieval schools. Both are comparatively short verses, uh, verse narratives of a little over a thousand lines. Both are found in collections of school texts, sometimes with each other, and both tell stories that focus on Achilles. Finally, both offer obvious attractions for adolescent boys. Taken together, the Achilles and Ilias Latina provide the background and lead up to the story of the fall of Troy told in book two of the Aeneid, which we can think of as a third Troy book for boys, just slightly older ones. In terms of difficulty, the Ilias Latina is the most straightforward text. Statius's Achilles is more complex rhetorically and assumes knowledge of the Aeneid. And the Aeneid itself is, of course, the most sophisticated of the three. But chronologically, the story on, unfolds first in the Achilles, with Achilles' life leading up to the Trojan War, then the Lat sorry, I wrote down Latin Iliad, but the Ilias Latina taking place during the Trojan War, and finally book two of the Aeneid with the destruction of Troy. And Achesis, or academic introduction to the Ilias Latina in a 14th century Italian manuscript in Berlin, outlines the connections between the works. He starts out, the author of this book is Homer. The subject matter is the history of Troy, from where the Greeks leave the island of Aulis until the place where Achilles kills Hector, lured from his city. Note that Statius starts the story from where Paris snatched Helen, and Achilles is taken up to the point where the Greeks were in Aulis. Then this author, that is of the Ilias Latina, begins, up to the killing of Hector. Then Virgilius begins in Book Two of the Aeneid, up to the destruction of Troy and beyond. Thus, the three authors treat the whole story of Troy in parts. Today, we take up the Achilles and the Ilias Latina in narrative order. First, the boyhood of Achilles, and then the Trojan War until the death of Hector in the Ilias Latina. In the teaching of the Aeneid that we examined in the last lecture, the focus was on Dido, in pain unto death, and the emotional power of her narrative was most emphasized, especially in her speeches. In Augustine's description of his profound reaction to Dido's suicide, he makes no mention of her gender or her age or status or indeed any aspect of her character other than her fate as an abandoned woman. But gender is at both the literal and figurative center of the Achilles as it was divided into books in the Middle Ages. At the beginning, Achilles is like a wild animal. At the end, he is a warrior. In between, he disguises himself as a girl and simultaneously fathers a child conceived during, during a rape. We can think of it as a text that reassures those who might act the part of women that they are really underneath all male. Although these aspects of the Achilles must have attracted the attention of students, medieval teachers describe the text differently. They concentrate on the changing background of the adults, the parental figures, who were behind each of Achilles' transitions. His life in a cave with his half-horse tutor, Chiron, his mother's attempt to get him to disguise himself as a girl, and the revealing or bringing forth of his manhood by Ulysses and Diomedes. For example, the Achesis in a late 13th century German collection of basic school texts um, that was actually owned at one point by Hartmann Schädel says, quote, the principal subject of this book is Thetis and Achilles. The secondary subject is Diomedes and Ulysses. A 14th century Italian manuscript in Venice is more elaborate. Quote, the subject matter of Statius in this work is Thetis and Achilles. His, Statius' intention is to describe in meter how Achilles was nurtured by Chiron on the, Mount of Pele, on the mountain of Pelion and how he was hidden from Chiron in the out-of-the-way island of Lycomedes in the habitus of a woman. And remember the term habitus, it comes up importantly later. And how he was led to the Trojan War with the war trumpet of Ulysses. Thus, for medieval teachers and students, the focus was on the adults who shape Achilles in the successive transformations. This method of characterization has classical roots. The fullest version of the so-called attributes of persons known in the Middle Ages is in Cicero's De Invencione, a text that has survived in more than 600 manuscripts, about as many as of the Aeneid. The attributes were 11 aspects of character, many with subcategories, used to create convincing scenarios in the law courts. They also provide a theoretical discourse for talking about the aspects of character in any kind of narrative. They are 11 in all, with a number of subcategories. The first one is name, the second one nature, 
And these subcategories of nature are particularly important with the Ilias Latina. They're whether the person is divine or mortal, of what sex, what nationality, place of birth, family, age, and what natural advantages and disadvantages of mind and body. The first subheadings under the third category, manner of life, are the most immediately relevant to the medieval achesis to the Achilleid we just read. These are, with whom was the character reared? In what tradition and under whose direction? With what teachers in the liberal arts? <coughs> what instructors in the art of living? What friends? And finally, what profession? The next subcategory is what management of private fortune, which doesn't seem very relevant to Achilles. But the last, what home life, is significant in its absence, in that Achilles really doesn't ever have one. The subcategories under manner of life have always made me think of the Achilleid. They just, it just pops up in my head when I read through them. And I think one of the things I want you to carry away with you is ways of thinking about books in terms of which categories of these um, attributes are evoked in them. Here are the other categories. The attribute of fortune covers the categories of whether slave or free, rich or poor, private citizen or an official with authority, um, if the latter, how the position was acquired, success, fame, what sort of children, and nature of death. And all of these always make me think of Dido. The fifth is a character's habitus, or characteristics acquired by careful training and practice. And I think Bourdieu's use of the term is important, but even more important for medieval studies is the use of it here in the Ciceronian tradition. The sixth category, feeling or emotion, or affectio. Cicero says about the attribute of emotions in creating character, quote, consideration of feeling or emotion, such as love or anger, um, is, he says, it's, it reveals an obvious inference because the force of these emotions is known and it's easy to note what the consequence of any of them is. Seventh category is interest or studium an unremitting activity ardently devoted to some subject and accompanied by intense pleasure. For example, interest in philosophy, poetry, geometry, or literature. The eighth category, purpose, is a deliberate plan for doing or not doing something. In the last three characters, not, uh, last three categories, Cicero treats together. These are a character's actions, accidents, and speeches. They're linked together in that one considers with each of these the three time frames, past, present, and future of all of them, and they're usually also interrelated. I have found these categories especially useful in dealing with descriptions of Latin texts, in, especially in Achesis, that seem to me alien, such as those that we just heard from the Achilleid. We do at times find these attributes applied to classical texts read in the classroom. In the anonymous collection of introductory chesses edited by RBC Huygens, the teacher commentator says, Lucan's subject matter was principally Pompey and Caesar and the attributes of persons, of which Cicero, called Tullius, enumerated 11. While the commentator goes through all of them giving examples, he foregrounds by moving it up a place in the list, the category of Fortuna. For Fortuna, he says, the major question is whether one is a rich man or a pauper obviously significant in terms of the relationship between Pompey and Caesar. Only secondarily is the subject we would expect listed, quote, his subject matter secondarily was the Romans raging war, unquote. I've been talking about the Achilleid as a whole work because that is how it is treated in most medieval manuscripts. Yet it is clearly unfinished. Statius announces in the prologue that he's going to tell, quote, the entire hero, trumpeting him forth from his hiding in Skyros and not stopping with the dragging of Hector, but going on to him, the great warrior, through the whole tale of Troy. And I'm using a forthcoming translation by Stanley Lombardo with his permission. What Statius left us, however, ends with Achilles on the way to Troy with Ulysses and Diomedes. According to Anderson, by the 12th century, when the Achilles began to be used widely as a school text, it had been divided into five books of roughly the same length. The fivefold division was the norm for the next several centuries and through most of the early printed editions. In fact, it was not until the 19th century that our present division at the beginning of the fragmentary book two became standard. 
According to the medieval division of the story as we have it, Book one, Achilles, uh, book one introduces Achilles' sea nymph mother, Thetis, his half-horse tutor, Huron, and finally, Achilles himself. Book two describes how Thetis takes Achilles to the island of Skyros and disguises him as a girl. Book three contrasts Achilles' forceful actions while disguised with the stagnation of the Greek army awaiting his arrival and the discovery of where he is hiding. Excuse me. In book four, Ulysses and Diomedes arrive and trick Achilles into revealing himself. Book five takes place on board ship when Achilles leaves with the two famous Greek warriors. And this medieval sense of the Achilles as a coherent whole was reified when a final line was added to many medieval copies of the text. And in this line, the ship carrying Achilles arrives at Troy. Quote, he says these things and the ship racing along reaches the shore. A 14th century French manuscript in the British Library summarizes the books as follows, quote, In the first book, he describes the solicitude of the mother and the cause of her solicitude. In the second, the carrying off of the son. In the third, the seeing of the Greeks. In the fourth, the trick. In the fifth, the taking to Troy. An even shorter summary was perhaps written as a class assignment in abbreviation. It's found in a 15th century Italian manuscript also at the British Library. There are a series of verbs summarizing the work that roughly line up with the book division. The Achilleid nurtures, hides, pleads, discovers, and arms. Let's look at the sequence of events even more closely. Book one of the medieval Achilleid begins after a dedication with Achilles' mother, who glimpses the Paris returning to Troy with Helen and sees the war to come. She asks Neptune for permission to sink the ships. She knows the Greeks will soon be scouring the land and sea for my son Achilles. She imagines him already playing at Lapith battles, that is, fighting members of an earlier race of warriors, a detail that would be important um, at the end of my talk, and measuring his height against his father's spear. When Neptune refuses, she has to figure out some other way to keep Achilles fated to die in the war from battle. Young Achilles has been living in a cave with his teacher, the centaur Charon, who has been um, teaching him to play the lyre as well as to hunt. The, but the boy has grown so strong that his depredations are causing trouble among the other centaurs. When Thetis arrives, Charon shamefacedly begs her to take Achilles away, giving three reasons that demonstrate his problematic strength, or in the notes that are marked down to them, they're each kinds of confirmatio or support for the argument for her to take him away. As a gloss in a late 13th or 14th early, uh, century Italian manuscript, again in the British Library, describes this speech, here the author puts the shame of Caron specifically, and it is stated in three parts, as he confirms what he said three times. The word confirmat is a technical term and originally refers to support for an argument or plea in the courtroom, like the attributes of persons also later applied to literary texts. Achilles arrives carrying two lion cubs, which he casually tosses aside when he sees his mother and runs to her. But by choice, it is the centaur with whom Achilles sleeps this last night, quote, preferring, though his faithful mother is there, the familiar chest. I'll just leave that. <laughs> but in book two, according to the medieval division, Thetis is the dominant adult figure. At the beginning, she ponders where to hide Achilles, and she's characterized by a long simile, comparing her to a mother bird, at first timid and feeling powerless, but then locating a place of safety. And uh, epic similes are the most annotated or noticed um, things in epic narratives, except perhaps for when speeches start and end. The word is comparatio, and you find it always written in fairly big letters that you can see easily. They're the easiest things to find in the manuscript. She picks the sleeping boy up and carries him through the water, drawn by dolphins in harness, she is a water nymph, to the island where she will hide him. It is here that Achilles awakes, dazed and confused, in the lines we heard at the beginning that so influenced Dante. A gloss in the manuscript from which I've just been quoting tells us that in these lines the author says in what condition Achilles found himself. Immediately, while he's still disoriented and dependent on her, Thetis tries to convince Achilles to pretend to be a girl. Her arguments are wily, and along with Chiron's threefold confirmatio, 
are the only speeches in this manuscript to which the partes orationis, or classical parts of an oration, are assigned. The partes orationis are based on the rhetoric adorenium, a pseudo-Ciceronian text that, all, that often traveled with De Invenzione and has survived in even more manuscripts. The relevant gloss states, quote, here he puts the words of Thetis to her son, namely Achilles, and first she introduces the argument, second she states the facts, third she supports her argument, these are all reasons for him to put on girls' clothes, fourth she refutes the opposing argument, and fifth she concludes. So in the exordium or introduction, she says that she, although divine, had to marry a human, which is what has left Achilles vulnerable to death. In her narratio, or statement of fact, she tells her son, you need to be a little less manly now and think it not unworthy of you to wear clothes. The Latin is habitus, actually, like mine. Next, in her confirmatio, or support for the argument, she notes that famous gods and heroes have donned women's clothes temporarily. Anticipating his refusal in her refutatio, she says that he would have to, sorry, he, she says that he would have to don the disguise for only a short while. In her conclusion, she reminds him first of what she has done for him, including protecting almost all of his body. And our first uh, surviving references to the Achilles heel are from this text. Finally, she assures Achilles that his teacher will never know. In response, Achilles' thoughts of his teacher, as well as of his father, help him to resist. As Stacia says, quote, working against her were his father, his great tutor, and the raw ingredients of a noble nature, unquote. A gloss on these lines in a 13th century German manuscript in Munich clarifies these fears. It echoes that is his term habitus, which if you remember the list in De Inventione, refers to characteristics acquired by careful training and practice, not just to habit, um, like a nun's habit. There were three reasons, quote, the, quote, there were three reasons why Achilles was refusing the habitus of women. First, because his father was a soldier. Second, because he was afraid of his teacher. And third, because he was afraid of how his teacher would regard him. And in fact, this is a digression into Greek material, but it's too interesting to leave out. Um, Thetis assures Achilles that Chiron would never heard of the, the time that he was disguised as, as a girl. But one of the many re, uh, rhetorical showpieces written by the great 6th century Greek rhetorician and teacher Labanius which Craig Gibson has recently translated as part of a volume of all of Labanius' Progymnosmata, or preliminary school exercises, includes, quote, what words would Chiron say when he hears that Achilles is living in the girls' quarters, unquote. It's an example of the school exercise called Ethopoeia, the speech and the voice of a character, an exercise I'll talk about more on Thursday. In Labanius' version, the centaur is horrified and at first refuses to believe the rumors. He cries, Oh, education and virtue, disgraced by these words, reinforcing the theme of education in Achilles' biography. Ironically, Karen assumes that Thetis will be distraught to hear the news. Who then, he asks, will be the messenger of this to Thetis? For being a goddess and a woman, she will be ashamed at the present situation. In fact, he's so upset that he vows to give up teaching. He concludes, quote, Let my school of virtue be dissolved. Let my beloved roster of youths be dismissed. For the outcome of this education, because dishonorable, makes me afraid, unquote. Okay, now back to our hero in the Latin world. After resisting his mother's arguments, Achilles catches a glimpse of a beautiful maiden, the king's daughter. His reaction to her is expressed in an epic simile of the animal lust of a young bull. Quote, Think of the herd's future dominant male when his horns have not yet filled out their circle. When he sees the snow-white heifer there in the pasture, his spirit catches fire and his mouth foams with first love, unquote. Suddenly getting close to her, even if it means dressing like a girl, becomes desirable to Achilles. Thetis takes advantage of the moment and teaches him deportment suitable to his disguise by training and practice. Probably not the meaning of habitus that Cicero had in mind, but still appropriate. Afterward, she takes her son, now impersonating Achilles' sister, um, to the king, instructing him to seclude Achilles in the women's quarters and not allow him, her, to exercise naked. I, I don't make this up. <laughs> Medieval Book 3 takes us first to the Greek camp at Troy and then back to Achilles. 
Both settings reinforce Achilles' male identity, just as he's been convinced to, do, to don women's clothes. From the, Greeks, from, sorry, from the Greeks, we learn the effects of Achilles' absence from the fighting. They are in desperate straits, and they need him. Meanwhile, back in Skyros, Achilles braids himself for his soft imprisonment. He says, quote, How long will you endure your fearful mother's schemes and waste the prime of your life in unmanly captivity? Then, under cover of the celebration of female religious mysteries, he rapes Didymia, who is the best female friend he has become in the meanwhile. Quote, he gets his way by force, and force, uh, we, is, off, is often glossed, Wilencia, in numerous manuscripts, putting all his heart into authentic embraces. <coughs> the gloss on this phrase, authentic embraces, says, not fictitious ones like before when she slash he presented herself himself as being a woman, unquote. The stars keep watch, and the moon itself mirrors her shame, its horns blushing red while, quote, the girl filled wood and mountain with her cries. The other girls think that her screams are a signal to begin the ecstatic, frenzied rites, and she, afraid to say what has happened, later secretly gives birth to a boy. The medieval fourth book begins with the voyage of Ulysses and Diomedes to Skyros, his location has been revealed in the uh, possession of Apollo by the uh, prophet Calchas. Now the public masculinity of the protagonist is restored as he literally takes up arms. Diomedes has hidden a shield and spear among the gifts, which Achilles snatches up when a war trumpet sounds. When he sees the weapons, quote, forgotten were his mother's words, forgotten his secret love, and Troy fills all his breast. Afterwards, Achilles reveals himself to the king. He places his grandson at Lycomenes' feet and tells of the rape of the king's daughter, absolving her of all responsibility. The lovers begin to spend what will be their last night together, and Didymia is soon overcome with dread. Part of her lament to Achilles is numed in, a, in one mid-12th century manuscript in Wolfenbüttel. Quote, Will you ever think of your safe harbor here worthy of you? Or when you come back, swollen with pride, bringing Trojan captives and all their possessions, will you want to forget where you hid out as a girl? I don't know what to beg for first or what to fear. Anxious as I am, what charge can I give you when I don't even have time to weep? While the nooming of her lament is significant, if only in one manuscript, other parts of her story are emphasized in later copies. In the 13th century Italian manuscript, of the Aeneid and the Achilles with little drawings that I mentioned in the first lecture. There are several drawings of her, one where she and Achilles are teaching each other and becoming close before the rape, and one of her with babe in arms in the next book where she's watching Achilles sail away. The most marked passage in this manuscript, however, is in the medieval book three where he rapes her. There's a drawing of her face and part of her torso at the beginning of the passage, and a maniculum or pointing hand at the description of the empathic response of the stars and the moons, and the moon. Her abandonment by Achilles appears to generate less empathy, perhaps because of students' continuing empathy with Achilles. In contrast to the Aeneid, where Achilles, where, I'm sorry, Aeneas, I wrote Achilles here, Aeneas appears deliberately less a figure for empathy than Dido. Medieval Book 5, the last book in the medieval structure, corresponds with the unfinished Book 2 in modern editions. In less than 200 lines, Statius simultaneously reaffirms Achilles' manhood and circles back to, both to his mother and the time when he was with his, quote, great parent, great, sorry, great parent, sweet Charon. It begins with the boarding of the ship that will take Achilles, Ulysses, and Diomedes to Troy. Achilles is now completely transformed. He's not just a man now, but also a warrior and a scary one. At first, when he gets on, no one dares to refer to the fact that he's actually been hiding out as a woman. The, instead, they all act as if he were walking up to the, this is a quote, were walking up to the ship straight from Chiron's uh, cavern. Before going on board, Achilles prays to his absent mother, asking her forgiveness for putting aside his disguise, but also asserting his new independence from her. Sorry, I've got a page out of order. When Achilles begins to have sad thoughts of his wife and baby left behind, and here's where the little drawing of them is put. She's holding him like this. 
Ulysses tries to distract him by asking finally what everyone on shipboard wants to know. Why was he hiding in such a disguise? Achilles demurs and says that his mother's crime would take too long to relate, and besides, he's planning to make up for those disgraceful clothes in battle. Instead, she asks Ulysses, he asks Ulysses, sorry, that was a Freudian slip. He asks Ulysses to tell him how the Trojan War started, which introduces a summary of the judgment of Paris and its tragic aftermath. Dynamedes, in turn, asks Achilles about his earlier life with Chiron, and Achilles provides new details. Quote, I didn't eat regular food or nurse from a breast, but tore at tough lion innards and sucked marrow from half-alive she-wolves. Other parts of his description, like hunting some lioness with her cubs in a hidden mountainside cavern, deliberately echo events from the beginning of the text. We find out that Chiron made Achilles learn to withstand frigid waters, outrun wild animals, including lapith horses, and push his body beyond human limits. But the tough love also included training in medicine and law. These experiences with Chiron, in which Achilles says he took joy, are all he remembers of his childhood. Statius's stark last half-line, my mother knows the rest, is a cold reminder of Achilles being wrenched away at the beginning of the text. And I spoke earlier about the added medieval line that brings him to the shore. It would be hard to find a text more saturated with themes of a character's upbringing, as Cicero outlined them, in what tradition and under whose direction, with what teachers, with what instructors in the art of living. His early experience with his first teacher was both brutal and sweet. The only physical signs of affection Achilles describes are with Chiron, and the time with his mother was a literal and figurative deviation from his manly path. During this deviation, he brutally proves his manhood, but also offers to stay rather than going to the war if the king wishes it. At the end of the text, he heads off to war with his two new mentors, Ulysses and Diomedes, the smartest and most archetypal warriors of the Greeks, who will, it is implied, turn him into one. In the Achilles, Achilles puts on women's clothes in order to act out his masculine, feels of aggre- his masculine feelings of aggression not in order to experience women's emotions. The Achilles reaffirms the superficiality of pretending to be a girl and reassures the masculinity of those who take on such a temporary disguise. It's tailor-made for classroom situations in which the fear of acting as a woman might surface, although I have never seen glosses that express this fear. It is, however, the question I'm asked most often by modern audiences. Now, on to the Ilias Latina. Although based on one of the most sophisticated works in the Western tradition, the Ilias Latina was, like the Achilleid, an introductory text in the medieval classroom. The world of the Ilias Latina is untroubled by gender ambiguity. Women are women, men are men, and what men do is fight battles. Achilles is, of course, the best warrior of all. The perspective of the Ilias Latina is more Trojan, that is Roman, than Greek. The Trojans are the good guys, and the Greeks, especially lustful Agamemnon and sly Ulysses, are the bad guys. Women are more marginalized than in the Iliad, and also simplified and generic. And the men are simplified and generic as well, but they receive more attention. When I was describing the Ilias Latina to a learned colleague, she said that it sounded like a boy's own Iliad or as I would add from a more American context, a classic comics version of Homer's story. The facts, just the facts, easily visualized and remembered. And to those who do not know the original, satisfyingly complete. A medieval way to articulate the simplification and straightforwardness that result is to look again at the very first attributes of persons in Cicero's De Inventione. These are the ones that are provided for almost every character in the Ilias Latina and that almost every gloss limits its explanations to. These are the character's name and or patronymic or parts of the character's um, nature. These ask for simple answers and while they are building blocks of the characters in other texts, it's in the Ilias Latina that the answers provide almost the complete characterization. So whether the character is divine or mortal, of what sex, and of what country, or in this case, of which side on the Trojan War. You get the point. The other categories are, within Natura, place of birth, family, 
age and what, with what natural inborn advantages and disadvantages of mind and body. These are equally basic and, from the point of view of this narrative, unproblematic. Thus, the appeal of this text, other than the filling in of narrative material, lies in the simplicity of the individual characters and the gangs of soldiers. These do not appeal, on the whole, to adult readers of the text, at least modern ones. An abbreviation seems to be an acquired taste, not much acquired today. But as George Kennedy, one of its two recent translators, has suggested, it is just for these reasons that the Ilias Latina is eminently suitable for the classroom, and he suggests not just the medieval one. The one-dimensionality of the characters makes it easy to tell who is who and who is fighting with or against whom. The deaths are told quickly and cumulatively. It's a massive abbreviation after all if still with enough gruesome detail to appeal to those who like that sort of thing. The arc of the war is compressed so that the delaying tactics on the part of Homer are not so deliberately painful and emotionally torturing. And speeches, even Nestor's, are very short. Sometimes they're avoided altogether. In fact, book nine, the, or the parts of book nine with the embassy to Achilles, no speeches. It just says they tried and he didn't, he didn't respond. Um, the whole scene between Hector and Andromache is just reduced to third-person narration. Again, no speeches. The result is a text tailor-made for boys. Lots of fighting and just a little bit of sex, and it's really fast. Usually predatory acts or thoughts on the part of Agamemnon. He's really awful in this text. Uh, although the reunion scene between Paris and Helen is especially cheesy. <laughs> I'm going to read a few lines from this. She's so excited when he comes back. She says, I feared lest the, the Doric sword would end our kisses. My mind was overcome. All color fled my cheeks, and the blood had left my limbs. I'm sorry, it's really hard. I just cannot read this seriously. She spoke and then wetted her face with flooding tears. Sad Alexander answers, Atreides has not conquered me, my love. The anger of chaste Pallas was to blame. After these words, their bodies locked in an embrace, and the glosses go over their bodies. That is Paris, that is Helen. As he lay with her, daughter of the swan, in her open bosom, she held the flames of Troy and of herself. And I wanted to read you just one of the kinds of glosses that you get elaborating on this to show you exactly how specifically they line up with the, the attributes of persons. So when it says, she, it says daughter of the swan, um, which is actually a, an expanded translation of the word, one of the glosses goes, the swan refers to the fable which is, Leda was the, daughter, was the wife of Tyndarius, with whom Jupiter slept in the shape of a swan. And from this came two eggs, out of one Castor and Pollux, out of the other Clytemnestra and Helen. And on account of this, Helen is called daughter of the swan. They're pretty straightforward. And as I mentioned, there are startlingly few speeches. I'll just skip right over my discussion of how little there are. But there is fighting, lots of fighting. As George Kennedy points out in his analysis of the work, added material almost always adds to the vividness and or the pathos of scenes of battle. And I want to just interrupt here and jump to the end. There are two manuscripts that have lists of the people who kill other people in this text. One of them um, at the end of the, comes in a manuscript that has the Ilias Latina followed by the Achilleid, and it lists divided. These are all the Trojans and who they killed. These are all the Greeks and who they killed. Another manuscript that has just the Achilleid, which doesn't even have the war in it, has afterwards a list of the heroes on both sides and who they killed. So that there's this incredible kind of mnemonic interest in who is in which side and which battle and um, how, how to keep track of them. Okay. Um, for vividness, and this is Kennedy's term, but I think it also helps to make the combatants sound more equal, two lines of description are added to the fight between Hector and Achilles. Quote, sweat flows in streams, dread sword grinds upon sword, foot clings with foot, and hand to hand. In the material from Book 5 of the Iliad, a soldier's observance of his brother's death generates a new simile. Quote, As when a bird that sees a hawk mangle the torn body of her young, and cannot, moved against, and cannot moved, move against him. Nor, anxious as she is, can she bring aid to her fledgling, but only beat her breath, breast with light wings. At the end is another simplification that increases the pathos of a soldier's death, 
and provides me with a transition to the topics of the third lecture tomorrow. This is the final scene of the Ilias Latina preceding the author's envoi. We see Andromache only, no one else to distract from her desperation as she attempts to throw herself and her son on Hector's funeral pyre. Quote, Among the lamentations, Hector's wife Andromache leads the cries and tears her breast and seeks to throw herself amidst the flames while holding to her Astyanax. But the crowd of countrymen under orders holds her back. She resists them all until the flicker of the flames dies down, and that greater leader has departed into ins unsubstantial ash." Unquote. In a dramatic planctus or lament on the fall of Troy that Peter Dronka describes in a wonderful essay, um, it's on Hector in 11th century Latin lyrics, three speakers, an unnamed Trojan, Andromache, and Hector, all speak, um, and there's a, the same refrain that follows um, each one. Part of Andromache's lament is as follows. And here she is addressing Hector when he's out there before Achilles kills him. Honor of my land, my husband, hear my words aright. Alas, we badly long for you. Though there is a war against our enemies, take care not to confront Achilles. Alas, we badly long for you. He surely said, Sorry, take care not to engage with him. He is surely said to be a goddess's son. Alas, we badly long for you. He, like his mother, is immune to, to fear. Fear of him even comes upon wild beasts. Alas, we badly long for him. For the centaur trained him as his pupil. Alas, we badly long for you. And he has indeed been trade, trained as we have heard tell. Alas, we badly long for you. He wounds Lapiths when he fights. He captures lions when he hunts. Alas, we badly long for you. His skin is so hard that their iron can scarcely hold. Alas, we badly long for you. So my husband, take great care. Do not go there. Now farewell. Alas, we badly long for you. Hector responds, of course, that he will fight and win, but he does not. The poem concludes, quote, when Hector says these words, Achilles kills him. Alas, we badly long for you. To, de to describe Achilles in the scariest way possible here, Andromache does not, as in the Iliad, talk about all of her relatives whom he has killed. Again, as I mentioned, that whole scene is just told in third-person discourse. Instead, she evokes the boy Achilles, as already able to fight grown men, even ones who don't exist anymore, and animals. That is, she evokes the Achilles of the Achilleid. Keep these pictures of Andromache that this lament is based on, from the Achilleid and also the ending of the Ilias Latina, for we begin tomorrow with a boy performing the lament, the lament of a woman whom some have thought to be Andromache. Thank you.